Hello, my name is Susan Steele Mahalan, and welcome to Art Beat. No, no, I am Susan Steele Mahalan, and that was Don Pollock from Philadelphia's Channel 6 Action News. He is a video essayist and humorist. Come into the world of Don Pollock with me. You're in for a real treat. Now, those were the good old days. No need for lawyers or legal analysts. There were only ten laws. Basic, straightforward stuff. Don't kill, don't steal, don't fool around with the lady next door. Simple, unambiguous, etched in stone, and incidentally passed with a flair and pageantry that's been unmatched since. However, what today's legislators lack in pizzazz when it comes to enacting laws, they more than make up for in volume. Rules, regulations, statutes, ordinances, governing everything from what we wear to what we don't tear off our mattress, that even for the smallest states in the country are present in a number that's almost unimaginable. Too many to count, that's for sure. There's uh, 31, title, 31 titles to the code, so it's 20 volume set. And of course, our code is small in comparison to some of the larger states. Consequently, there are laws on the books that cover just about everything. For example, how many times has this happened to you? You're ready for a quick lunch, but you can't find a can opener. So you settle for the next best thing. And simply pull out the low loaded 38 caliber revolver that you keep in your kitchen drawer and use it Make my day. to shoot the can open. However, what you probably didn't even realize is that what you're doing is illegal, in Wildwood, New Jersey anyway, which has an ordinance specifically prohibiting the opening of canned goods by shooting at them with a revolver. The type of bizarre law that is not all that uncommon on any level. Certainly it's common. You could go into any law library and just page through either the uh, statutes of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania or the ordinances of the city of Philadelphia and you'll find uh, much more than that. Laws like the one here in Pennsylvania that says you cannot go fishing if you happen to be sitting on a horse at the time. As a matter of fact, legally, you can't even take a horse with you on a fishing trip. A statute that's not likely to be enforced, but nonetheless is, is still on the books as a, as a holdover from, from a previous time. <laughs> Excuse me, we're not really fishing here. We're just doing this as an example. Well, it might have been a problem in the past. Generally, a, a statute or an ordinance is passed because uh, someone perceives a problem that has to be solved, goes to their legislator and eventually a, a statute or an ordinance is passed. Although it's hard to imagine what exactly led to the Pennsylvania law that prohibits loud talking at picnics, the law that prohibits depositing candies on a lawn, and the law that during the performance of a wedding makes it specifically illegal to fire a cannon during the ceremony. I don't know if firing cannons in church was a problem at the time that uh, act was passed. Undoubtedly, it was, at least to somebody. And because laws remain in effect essentially forever until they are specifically repealed, the resulting sheer volume of statutes make for a good hiding place for those that don't really belong there anymore. Most of our obsolete laws are there largely because no one knows that they're there. Which is why activities like loud talking at picnics or fishing from a horse are technically still grounds for landing you in legal hot water. <laughs> Right. Next time I'll check the law, okay? I'm sorry, I'm gonna break you. But there's another reason that uh, unusual laws. This uh, this show is called Art Beats, and it I really uh, to me that's kind of a compliment that you would uh, you're, you do shows, you do interviews with artists, and uh, you've come to me, which which I mean I'm I work at a newscast uh, on a news station. It, it, it isn't something that many people would consider art, but. Uh, as I said, I, uh, it's a high compliment to me that you would consider the stuff that I do to fall into the category of art because in a way that is sort of what I try to present. I try to uh, take, I mean, what, what is art? Art is just taking ordinary things and combining them in, in ways that, that, that make them more than the sum of their parts. I mean, a poem is nothing but English words. I mean, they're all in a dictionary for anybody to see, but if you combine them in a certain way, you come out with a poem, which uh, raise, raises the whole level of, of, of uh, the words. It, it, it's more than what the words say. It, it takes it up a notch. Uh, so all I'm doing is taking, I try and, I, I try and strive for that same type of thing. I try and uh, take v uh, visuals, try and take the photography that the uh, cameraman provides me with, perhaps adding some music that I heard once on a jazz record or something else, and then uh, try and uh, write the script with a little bit more maybe irreverence or a little bit more fun with the language, and combining all those things together perhaps create 
an experience type thing that for the person who's just about to turn into bed on the, after watching the late news brings a little kick, uh, a, a, a little uplifting uh, e experience upon watching this thing that maybe he wouldn't have gotten if, um, if he had the sound turned down or maybe he wouldn't have gotten if he just uh, was, was reading the script. You get what I'm saying? It, it, you, you can't help but come out with something better. Th I mean, you can't help but come out when you have music and visuals and script combining them together is going to come out with something better than each of them individually. But that's what you you, you strive for, and you end up with uh, uh, w with something that that is satisfying. You you presented some idea that you have in your head to the people, uh, and you you're doing it in a way just like you do it if you were. If you were coming home from school and you, uh, some kid in your class brought in something for show and tell and you're running home to tell your mommy, boy, guess what I saw in school today? This kid had this thing. And that's all I'm doing. I mean, that's, you know, my job, my career is show and tell, essentially. I go out, see something, wow, that's great. Wait till I tell these, you know, 100,000 viewers tonight, you know? And it, it's a lot of fun. It's really satisfying. It, it's worked out very nicely. Actually, this job has dovetailed very nicely into what I really have always uh, enjoyed doing best, and that is just finding out uh, weird, offbeat facts and telling them to people. I mean, who doesn't like learning something really neat and then going, uh, going to your friend's house or going to the bar that night and saying, hey, guess what I found out today? Did you know that? And, and that's essentially what I do for my job. I try and find out uh, strange or offbeat things that people aren't quite aware of, but uh, pique their curiosity anyway. Uh, it, it, it's a matter of, uh, these are none of the stories that I do, <laughs> I mean, are, uh, involve facts that you really need to know. I mean, there, there, there's nothing that, that, that is really urgent about, uh, gee, I, I, we're doing a, a, an in-depth investigation as to why you never see baby pigeons in Rittenhouse Square. You know, all the thousands of pigeons are all the, you know, they're all the same size. You know, where, where are the little, you never see baby ones. You never, this is not something, this is not vital information. This is not something you need to know. But it's fun to know. Everybody's interested in it. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't matter your, your uh, uh, social status, uh, race, creed, color. I mean, everybody says, you know, that's a good question. Well, how, how come you never do, you never see baby pigeons? That's a, you know, and, and what it does, I think, is it piques the curiosity that, uh, that burns uh, within everybody's mind. It's more obvious when you're in kindergarten, when you're in first grade, because uh, kids are always fascinated by new things, learning new and different things. And uh, by, uh, but we have to turn that flame of curiosity down to a pilot light when we grow up, because we're dealing with the mortgage payment and we're dealing with our jobs and the car insurance and everything else, all the other disasters that are happening in day-to-day -day life. Uh, but I think that is what these kinds of subjects, these kinds of offbeat topics appeal to, is that little tiny flame of curiosity. I may Thank appear you. to be really enjoying myself and really having a good time uh, when, when I'm doing these reports, but that's not really the case. At least, at least it's, it's not the case uh, that, that, that I'm having the kind of fun that, that people really think of as fun. When you think of fun, you're thinking of uh, just letting loose and having a great time and going with the flow at a party and just, uh, hey, well, let's see what happens. Yeah, in, in a way, that's, that's fun and that has its, its place, but that's not what's going on when we're, when we're putting together these stories because you have to, you have to think about the presentation, about what, uh, what you're, uh, how you're coming across to convey this information or to convey this point or to bring this, uh, this experience of whatever you're reporting on to the viewer. There's nothing. There's nothing more boring to a viewer than to sit and watch other people having a good time. You know what I'm saying? It, it's sort of like you're, you're not in the party. You're, you're just sort of you're outside looking through this little window that, that's, that's 21 inches square. And, and you're just watching all these people. Whoa, they're having a great day. I'm at a party. And it's like, wow, this is not really. But what you have to do is um, take uh, the visual image on that screen and present it in a way that involves the viewer, that uh, brings them in and, and, and uh, lets them experience whatever the subject is or whatever the, the idea or the theme is. And as a result, uh, you have to 
constantly be thinking of your camera angles, uh, what sound, uh, the, 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 the flow of, of action, the, the sequence. It's almost like making a mini movie for 90 seconds or however long these reports uh, are usually lasting. And a, a, as such, there, there, there's not that kind of fun, party, let's just see what happens, fun involved in it. it, it it's intellectual fun, but you really have to be on the ball and be thinking of it all the time. Came across, for example, one of my favorite reports. I don't know why I thought this was such a hoot, but this there was a dog working, working at a service station in in uh, in North Philadelphia. This was a, a service station where this guy had trained his Springer Spaniel while while the gas was being pumped, the Springer Spaniel would come around to the side of the car, you'd roll down your window, then the driver would hand the dog a $5 bill, a $10 bill, whatever. The dog would take it in his mouth and bring it all the way back to the store, uh, back to the, to the guy in the, you know, the, the cashier. The cashier would take it, give the dog change if necessary. The dog would bring it back, you know, kind of got a little slimy. But that, that, was, uh, that was fun to, to see. But then, the I mean, it was fun to see for about 30 seconds. And then, okay, now we've got to work to make it fun for the audience to see, too. That's the important thing. Hey, I'm sitting there looking at it, and it's great. But I'm looking at it in the environment of the gas station. I'm there. It's really funny seeing this live there. Automatically seeing it on a screen this big reduces how funny it is just to see. Now you've got to work that much harder to bring that same, wow, is that great experience to that level, to that size, and have the audience uh, under, understand what a, what a strange and, and, uh, and bizarre uh, uh, a feat this guy, this guy did in training his dog to do that. Even during the busiest part of the day, drivers pulling into Dan Farazano's gas station in North Philadelphia are guaranteed fast and efficient service that's unmatched anywhere else. Because while Greg is there filling your tank and Dan Jr. is checking your oil so that you don't have to wait, hey, Charlie. Uh, Charlie is there to take your money and get your change. Yes, indeed, he's been helping out around here for the past seven years, old Charlie has. That's the first thing I met when I came up, it was Charlie. The kind of dedicated employee who's not afraid to put the money where his mouth is and lend a helping hand to the operation, even though technically he really doesn't have a hand to lend. Oh, he's been helping me out for the past seven years since he was a pup. Automatically, he took it up himself. I mean to say, I got it for supply him the cookies. That's the whole secret. I don't give him a cookie, he'll refuse to give me the money. That's a giant Springer Spaniel. A regular Spaniel weighs about 35 pounds, but this one weighs 80 pounds. With the cookies I feed him, I guess. He's been a big dog ever since. He sits on the step when he sees a car come up. The customers all call him out there, and people like to look at that. My customers, they enjoy it. I think it's wonderful. They really do. The people come in to see the dog and start us to get gas. I come out of my way now. It's the neighborhood. They bound back here to get gas and to see Charlie, too. The kind of customer loyalty that has helped business so much that Charlie's had to learn how to handle credit cards now as part of his daily routine. Not as easy because they're harder to hold on to in your mouth, and besides, it means having to make a second trip to bring the receipt back to the customer. Uh, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. I think a dog deserves a good chance to work in him. We have to feed him. But all in all, aside from the fact that the receipts end up getting, well, a bit moist. Yeah, he gets the receipt wet, and uh, I don't know how he does the money. I always give him the exact change. <laughs> For motorists, a fill-up at Dan Ferrazano's gas station means being able to cash in not only on service that's quick and efficient, but on workers <laughs> who are unique when it comes to subjects, golly, I, uh, you know, it, it, it's always easy to do a feature news report on something extremely obvious, like, you know, hot air ballooning. Well, of course, you're going to play lush music, you're going to show the hot air balloons rising, it's just beautiful, these are the kinds of things that photographers, you know, will send on their resume tape to, you know, to news directors around the country. Because, oh, look at a wonderful little blue sky and the billowing, you know. Those are, those are the obvious ones. Sometimes it's, it's, I find it a challenge to, uh, to pick something that's less obvious and try to make it visually interesting. I mean, uh, sometimes you want, you'd like to pick a story, uh, I like to try and pick a story that's a, almost a newspaper article almost a magazine article. See, there are different, there are different kinds of, of news stories. Some are much more appropriate for, like, a hot air ballooning story. That's much more appropriate for TV because you can show the things flying and the hawks circling and all that sort of stuff. Whereas if you read about that in a newspaper article, 
they might have one black and white picture and, that, and that's about it. Whereas there are other stories that are much more appropriate for magazines and, and newspapers because uh, they're more cranial, I, they're, they're more abstract, they're more conceptual, and there's really not much to, to see. And, and, but, but sometimes that's a challenge to try and present something on TV and try and make it interesting. What do you do after that? That's the, 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 the mental challenge, the, which, which I find kind of interesting sometimes. Uh, For many, a trip to France would be an ideal summer vacation, except that the whole country is filled with people who speak French and wouldn't understand a thing you were saying. But it's a situation that's not really as big a problem as you might think, because although you may not realize it, you already know how to speak French. You've been speaking it for years. It's just that the sounds and the words that make up the French language you've been saying in the wrong order, which is exactly the principle of a new language guide book that claims to be able to teach you fluent French in less than a minute. It's English. It's not phonetics. It's not, you know, any of the old methods which you have to study and memorize. This, you just pick it up and it comes out. For example, we're all familiar with the uh, English word lark and the word debt and the word tree and oomph. But if you put all four of those words in one sentence, it doesn't make any sense in English. But if you say it, any French person will be able to understand that you mean lark de triomphe. The picturesque Paris landmark that will now be the second most memorable thing about your foreign visit. The first being that pocketbook that uses what author Mike Ellis calls linguistic engineering to get anybody talking as fluently as a native. A very simple example, if you want to say beautiful ladies first, follow the arrows over to the English words, toujours après les belles. It's written in English, but it comes out French. Toujours après les belles. It was just something that I, I saw a need for, especially with corporate travelers. But I just couldn't communicate, and I thought it's got to be something easier for them. You're going to have an English accent anyway, so you might as well say it how it sounds. Parlez-vous italien? Parlez-vous italien? Italien! Oh, italien! Basically, it lets you speak a foreign language without effort. I don't know the first thing about foreign languages. But you should say, oh, cool, need day. That means I don't understand. <laughs> to sure be in. Yeah, I know it works. That's a pretty good phrase book. I like that. Put out by Valley Forge Publishing, the $6 pamphlet takes a variety of everyday phrases, like, it's nice to meet you, and allows anyone to exude a suave continental charm. C'est un plaisir. C'est un plaisir. A method where the response, thank you very much, is able to be uttered fluently, even in Italian. Mille grazie. Mille grazie. Yes! <laughs> and with phrases like, where do you work, uh, the book's different sections also allow momentary fluency in Spanish and German. Deine Berufes. Deine Berufes. The same method could even be used in uh, foreign languages to uh, teach people how to speak English, all by using uh, seemingly senseless combinations of ordinary words, like what we sit on, uh, an airline sickness bag, or, or a group of female sheep, which, when spoken together, uh, create a meaningful phrase. Uh, take it from me, Don Pollock. Chair no six action use. Chair no six action news. Chair no six action news. Chair no six action news. That's wonderful. I like that. I mean, we go, um, a lot of times we uh, uh, just go out to the story location. Hopefully, uh, ideally, again, in trying to keep these things as simple as possible and as far as presentation goes and uh, take up as little time as possible. We do it and try and do it in one location, if that's ever possible, too, at the most. You go there, and it's just the cameraman and me, and we interview the, whoever the subject is of the story or thereabouts, get whatever things we need, try and figure out a kind of direction, a rough outline of, well, I'll start out by saying this, and then we'll go into his interview about uh, of where he says this and this and this, and that'll lead to me uh, uh, doing something ridiculous but saying, but also, this is also the, uh, something to do with it, too, and then we go into another element of the story, and, it, and you just, uh, you're writing a, a, little, a little short essay in your head, and uh, you, you get only the essentials you need out there. You just, you just get the person's interview and what you're going to say on camera maybe in the middle of the piece or on the end of the piece, which is sort of equivalent to like writing, uh, writing an essay and writing the middle paragraph of the essay before you even realize what the rest of the essay is going to say completely. It's, it's not always an easy thing to write that middle. But you go out, then you come back to the station, you view all the tapes, you just sit by the tape machine, you press the button, you watch everything you have, and uh, hopefully you won't come up with a brilliant inspiration of, uh, Oh, I should have done this, you know. Hopefully, you can. You've already thought of all that you should have done on the scene, and anything else creative that you might want to come up with, you can do back at the station. Meaning the way you edit the thing, the way you uh, add whatever music you might want to add to it, or the way you write something. 
the most important thing, the, the, the focus, the primary focus of any piece I do is trying to convey some sort of information. After all, I've never, uh, you can't ever forget that it, it is a newscast, and a newscast is supposed to inform. And uh, in that light of looking at it, there's really, uh, there's really no reason for pieces like mine to be on a newscast, unless they convey some information about something. As I said, it might, uh, it might not always be useful information, but it, it's something that's interesting, something that tweets people's imaginations or their curiosity or something that they would uh, want to, uh, uh, that, that they might be interested in knowing. And that is the primary focus of all the, uh, the reports that I do, either conveying information or conveying an observation about the, what, human condition, I don't know, our culture, our society, you know, stepping back from a trend and saying, now this is where we're at at this point. Conveying something like that, that has to come first. Then the humor, uh, whatever chuckle I might be able to embellish it with, uh, if I can throw it in there, that comes second. The piece, can st the piece has to be able to stand without the added chuckle, if necessary. Joseph Sabo was crowned King of Cartoons by the City Paper in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in August of 1989. His cartoons express his belief in the power of visual communication and in the international power of symbols. During this segment, you will meet the man who is the editor of a cartooning magazine entitled Witty World. He recently stated, since I came to the U.S., I haven't denied my Hungarian origin, but my philosophy has changed. Here, I am first a human being. My nationality is secondary. Joe, I'd like you to tell us um, why you decided to leave Hungary and come to the United States. Tell us about what you were doing there and, and why you came here. Um, I was working for a national daily newspaper called Magyar Nemzet. That was the most popular uh, paper in the country. It was uh, sort of a, an intellectual paper. And um, I was second in command of the daily operation. And soon, uh, uh, after a year or so, I, I realized that I needed a, an additional medium to, to express my thoughts. And I uh, accidentally became a cartoonist. I was asked to do a cartoon. The cartoon was uh, taken to Paris to an international editorial meeting. And um, I was so lucky that I, I don't think there is another <laughs> lucky person like I was then uh, is uh, in the world. Uh, that particular cartoon that I drew, the, the very first one in my life, was picked up by papers like uh, the Asahi Shimbun in Tokyo, the Le Monde in, in Paris, uh, the Politica in Belgrade, Yugoslavia, Journal de Brazil, uh, altogether 16 different papers. So I, uh, <laughs> it's funny, but I thought that if the first cartoon was so successful, I perhaps I, I should do another one, and I started drawing cartoons. And so uh, a few years before my departure from Hungary, I, I was a newspaper editor and a cartoonist um, on the side. Then um, in about early 1979, uh, it started uh, getting very hard on me that every day we had to sit in at an editorial meeting and we were given orders by the, the Central Committee. And I, I realized that I wasn't myself. I was uh, just a, a part of uh, a big, uh, a tremendous uh, manipulating device. It was telling something else that was in reality. Uh, we had to explain the news in a different way. I, um, I couldn't put the most important article on the cover, in my judgment, the most important ones. I, uh, I had to follow uh, 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 orders from the party, and um, my creativity was um, in sort of in chains. I, I really didn't feel that I was free to do what I wanted to do. And I'm, I, I had a hard time. I wasn't the kind of person who can 
take orders easily and execute them. I, I wanted to be an impact, some kind of an impact, just even if it's a, t a tiny small impact, but something for myself. And that system denied me of that. Um, that uh, basically prompted our decision that we would leave the country. In 1979, that was uh, almost 11, 12 years ago, there was absolutely no uh, prospect of any changes. Um, we felt that we were young enough and uh, wise enough to make the decision uh, for the kids and for ourselves. So I asked for a passport. I got it. Which, which was pretty unusual because I got it for the whole family. And uh, back in the, the golden days of communism, uh, they never let a family uh, out of the country uh, in full numbers. I mean, they always kept someone at home to make sure that they come back, go back. But I got the, uh, the passport for the whole family because I was supposed to be a good communist as a newspaper man, as uh, uh, a person who was uh, part of the, the big mouthpiece of communism. And um, we left the country. It was supposed to be a, just a trip, a, a tourist trip, uh, a round trip in Switzerland, Germany, and Austria. Uh, but we planned well ahead, and uh, we didn't turn back. We didn't go back. Joe decided that there was no future in Hungary. He chose the United States because he wanted to integrate, to have a new home, to feel at home within a country of so many cultures. Joe, tell us what Witty World is and um, why you decided to begin a magazine like this. I, I feel that with um, a magazine like this, if uh, it is edited the right way, if it's done the right way, um, if it's in the, in the hand of responsible people, maybe uh, good things can be done, achieved. Because cartoons are so easy to read, because when you open up a newspaper and you see the editorials and the, the long articles, you don't have enough time to read, you go to the cartoon and in a second you get the message. So if people don't read every article or, or don't read anything in a newspaper, it's almost sure that at least they take a quick look at a cartoon. Therefore I felt that there is a tremendous responsibility in cartooning. How and what cartoonists are saying with their cartoons. And I felt that if this magazine is done right, then we can help uh, to bring about peace, cooperation, international understanding. We, we could become more aware of the other cultures and uh, uh, so we can understand them better. And um, confrontations, misunderstandings, uh, war, uh, could be avoided or, or the chance would be minimized. Sabo ended his first editorial in the initial issue of Witty World with these words. Obviously, I strongly believe in the communicative power of cartoons, but I would add that cartoonists should use their power for educational purposes. We know, as Boss Tweed recognized over a century ago, that many who are illiterate or semi-literate can gain knowledge and perspective on current events by reading cartoons and comics. Until the majority of the world population is literate, the more silent cartoons are particularly effective. Let us hope that the butterfly of literacy and education pollinates the entire world. Thank you for being with us at Artbeat. I'm Susan Steele Mulholland saying good night. <laughs> Thank you.